Yeah, it, it, blindness and blind spots. This morning we're going to be looking at the story of uh, blind Bartimaeus. Interesting man. Um, anyone who is blind in Jesus' day uh, had to beg on the streets. There was no way for them to work. I mean, think about it. Okay, t tell them to go out and pull the weeds. <laughs> Again, they know what's a weed and what's a good, what's a good plant. Uh, they couldn't work. And the only way that they could survive was to sit along the street where people came regularly and beg. Now, if you're a beggar sitting on the street, do you know when somebody gives you a good coin and when somebody gives you a bad coin? Or when the little kid comes running up there and he decides it's time to tease the beggar blind man. And so he puts something, the man, oh, here's something for you. And the man holds out his hand and he puts a bug in his hand or something like that. Buzzing bee. They were all kind of times mistreated. And this is a man who's sitting along the street as Jesus comes through. Now, this is an interesting time for Jesus. We've been following Jesus now for over two and a half years as we've been going through the Gospel of Mark and we've been following him traveling around the countryside, but he's now on his final leg of the journey to Jerusalem. We are a week away from Jerusalem's experiences. In fact, we're only six hours walk from Jerusalem as we come to the city Jericho. Jericho is a rather unique place, right? So, some of you remember the old, the old story from the Old Testament? As the children of Israel came up to enter the promised land, where did they go? First Ai and then to Jericho, right? Okay, you never answer that phone when I call you. <laughs> Okay, well, now I know it works. <laughs> Jericho, the city of Jericho. It's a fortified city, walls around it. And enemies cannot penetrate it because of these walls. And the Jews come up to it, and they're still not that well versed in military battle. So God tells them, okay, look, I want you to know that I am with you. In order to prove that I'm with you, I want you to walk around the walls of Jericho. And they're going to do that for seven days straight. And on the seventh day, they're going to walk around that wall seven times. Oh, it's even better than that. At the front of the troops are going to be the worship team. <laughs> okay. They're going to be out there with their trumpets, with their various instruments and all. And they're going to be out there praising God ahead of everyone else as they go around. And they're all going to have the, also their ram's horns. And at the end of the seventh day, at the end of the seventh time marching around, you're all going to stop, pull out the ram's horn, blast on it, and then yell, praise God. And what's going to happen? The walls crash down to the ground. And Jericho... Jericho is a city that's set free. By the way, um, I think I have a picture up there, Daryl. Uh, this is modern Jericho. Uh, if you could see it better, can any of you see that picture? It's Jericho means city of palms. You see a few palms there? Jericho's down in the desert area just before you go up. There. Let's go to the next slide too, okay, Daryl? Now this one is a little harder to see, but... <laughs> There's a canyon right up there, and you can sort of see that it splits through between those two hillsides. And that is the path that you take from Jericho up the hill to Jerusalem. About 12 miles walk away, six hours. That's how close Jesus is to Jerusalem, to the place where he's about to die. You remember, he has just just been telling the disciples third time I'm going to Jerusalem I'm going up there to die and then he adds to it this time he says I'm going to be insulted I'm going to be betrayed I'm going to be turned over to the Gentiles they're going to torture me and whip me and spit on me and then I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to come rise again in three days and even the third time the disciples still, still didn't quite get it you might also remember that at the completion of that comment 
right outside of Jericho, incidentally, James and John come. Jesus, we want you to do anything we ask you. Okay, moms and dads, you know when a kid comes and asks that, uh-uh, right? <laughs> do whatever I ask, mom. <laughs> All right, uh, what's coming after this one? <laughs> Don't make a promise in that moment. And, and Jesus does. And then, well, what, do you, what is it that you want? Well, we want to sit at the right and the left hand of you in your kingdom. We want to be important in your kingdom. Jesus will converse about that and he ends the conversation with saying, you know, I'm probably not going to give that to you. Uh, but yeah, you are going to suffer. You are going to die. But we're heading on to Jerusalem. The disciples, the other ten disciples get ticked off, indignant's the word. They get all upset because the two, James and John, the sons of thunder, went with mommy and they got a hearing by Jesus that the ten others wish they had uh, had themselves. They wanted that place of importance just as much as those other two. And really, the only reason they're ticked off is not because James and John asked, but because they asked before they got the chance to. Now Jesus heads to Jericho. If you were to read the story in Matthew, you would find that there's a, another conversation that happens as well, and that there's a man named Zacchaeus. Do you remember the story? Zacchaeus. Oh, look, Debbie, you want to sing the song for us? Zacchaeus. There he was. And he climbed up into a sycamore tree, right? So that he could see Jesus coming. Can the rest of you want to sing it with her? <laughs> and he climbs up in that sycamore tree to see Jesus. And, and Jesus comes up to, to Zacchaeus' tree and says, Come on down, Zacchaeus. I'm coming to your house today. And he goes to his house, has dinner with him. And Jesus says at the end of that conversation that salvation came to the home of Zacchaeus. Now Matthew says that 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 was after Jesus had already healed blind Bartimaeus. Mark leaves Zacchaeus out of the conversation completely. He just is focusing on this miracle. And he says that it, the miracle happens as they're, leaving, uh, as they're leaving Jericho. Does it matter whether they were going in or coming out? Don't think so. The guy who probably had the best eyewitness account was Mark because he got his information from Peter who was right there. Luke gets his from other sources, Matthew as well. So, so, so whether that matters or not, here's one of the things we want to find out from this. That the last two miracles that Jesus performed were at Jericho. The last man to come to salvation before Jesus went to the cross was at Jericho. Now you ought to stop and say, wait a second, why? Why was it that Jesus is heading up to Jerusalem, the holy city, the place where he's going to die, why is it that there's no more miracles after he leaves Jericho? Why is it that no one else is saved until after the crucifixion? Could it be something of the blindness of the religious people that were in Jerusalem who were too blind to see their blind spots? Is that maybe why the last miracle that Jesus performs before he heads to Jerusalem is the healing of a blind man? Well, let's look at the story. It's Mark, the 10th chapter. It's the last portion of the chapter and we begin reading at verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith 
has, re has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. God help us to understand and help us to see what we do not see. Jesus is on a mission to hell. He is heading up the road from Jericho. He's going to Jerusalem in order to go and break down the gates of hell. And he will do that by dying on a cross. And upon his last breath on that cross, betrayed, denied, rejected, assaulted and abused by the religious people, he will die on that cross in order to go and set the captives free from hell. Jesus is on a mission, a mission against hell. And as he's heading up there, there's this man along the side of the road. This beggar guy, oh, come on. Another guy standing at a street corner with a sign in his hand wanting somebody to give him money. And he starts to cry out, hey, hey, God, hey, hey who, who, who is it? What's all the noise about? Because he can tell something's going on. By the way, you probably should be aware of the fact that that Jericho is the main route into Jerusalem unless you want to go through Samaria. If you're coming anywhere from the east, you've got to go through Jericho to get up to Jerusalem. Of course, if you don't mind Samaritans, well, but you're a good Jew, and good Jews mind Samaritans. They really don't want to go through their land. So you go through Jericho. You make the extra journey down to the center part of the country, and you go into <laughs> Jericho, and then you head from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And you, as a good Jew, have been required to go to Jerusalem. In fact, you're required to go there to celebrate the Passover. And the Passover is coming in just a week. And so you're journeying with several other hundreds, perhaps thousands of other people that are on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Now, you're among the outlying people, and so you've been hearing about Jesus, and some of you really like Jesus. Unlike the people in Jerusalem who they're concerned about status quo, they're concerned about position, they're concerned about their own importance, they're concerned about what they can do to earn their somehow salvation and their right relationship with God. And so they do not like the fact that Jesus might be coming. You're walking with all these people and you're heading up there and there's quite a commotion because you've found out Jesus is right there ahead of you and you're walking alongside Jesus. And then you hear this guy, you know, well, who is it? Who is it? And it's Jesus of Nazareth. And did you notice how the blind man responds to that? Jesus, son of David. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 you got it wrong. We said Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, no, no. Jesus, son of David. We said it's Nazarene. He's just a Nazarene. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Would you just be quiet already? Bug off, okay? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the word there is that he's hollering loudly trying to get the intention of Jesus. Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? The, the, this young man, this blind Bartimaeus, has an understanding that a significant number of other people in the crowd don't get. Why does he call him son of David? Because he understands, and that's the title for the Messiah. You see, Bartimaeus might be blind, but he's not deaf. He might not be able to see but he can hear all the things that's been happening around him. In fact, if you've ever noticed, sometimes people that are blind or have some lack of one sense, their other senses are more in tune. Any of you know the man named Ken Miedema? Come on, dear, you should at least raise your hand. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Ken Miedema is a musician, pianist, composer. Uh, he, some of you years ago may have heard a, a song called Moses. It's a great ballad about the story of Moses and all. Ken Meadham, a blind musician, been blind since birth. Taught himself piano, learned how to play, composes music and all at the piano without being able to see anything. 
we were pri privileged to have Ken come to our home one, one day because he was going to do a concert at our church. And I somehow, I don't remember how, but somehow I got, the, got chosen as the one that he was going to have dinner with. So he comes to our house. We walk in the door and I take his coat from him. I start to walk down the hallway to open the door of the closet to put the coat in there. I move the hanger, get about ready to hang it up. I thought, you know, I don't want to forget this coat. So instead, I close the closet door. I walk back out. There's a rocking chair sitting in the living room and I put the, ro the coat over the rocking chair. We then go into the other room, the family room where our dining room table is and we sit down at the table and we start to eat. And he dishes himself up on this plate and he's eating well. Man, that's amazing how he's able to do that. He, can, he, can, he, he can't see and yet he can find his food and we're chatting a little bit about that. He's being pretty open about things. And, and then as we get up to leave, we walk out and he walks over to the other room, grabs the coat, go, goes out the door. Okay, that was weird. How do you know that coat was hanging there? We get to the church and we have a bride's room. And the bride's room is also a place that we meet for prayer. And so before the concert, I open up the door, unlock the door, open up the door, and we go into the bride's room. He walks in. There's a sofa sitting over here. He walks in, goes over here, sits down on the sofa. Okay, like, now I'm really questioning things. How much can you see, Ken? None. Not at all. Are, are you faking it on me? <laughs> Ken? Did you know that that sofa was there? He says, well, you see, Bill, when, we, when we, you opened the door uh, and walked in the room, he says, I could hear that there was something long over here. And it was low, and so I just decided I'd take a chance. It could be either a table or a sofa, and so I went and sat down on it. <laughs> yeah, how, how'd you know the coat was over there on the rocking chair? And it, it's all about the, his senses that are accentuated. His ability to hear things is greater. Bartimaeus has been listening and hearing what's been happening around him. Don't you think he's maybe now heard about Zacchaeus? Has he not heard? Jesus has gone through Jericho before. Has he not been hearing the stories? People have been traveling in and out of Jericho and they're talking about Jesus of Nazareth. They're talking about the miracles that he's been performing. He might be blind, but he's not deaf and dumb. And he's heard about Jesus and he's already at a place of this this guy's got to be the Messiah you don't do the things that Jesus has done without being the Messiah that's what Bar Bartimaeus is believing this man is the Messiah and so he cries out Jesus son of David have mercy on me did you notice that Mark puts in a, a little parenthetical phrase in there when he says Bartimaeus he describes him as what open your Bibles he describes him as what you're really quiet today come on I'm gonna have to, have to do something to wake you up again get up and check your spots again he describes him as son of Timaeus Timaeus. No, it's not Timothy, dear. Timaeus. What does Timaeus mean? Timaeus means highly prized. His dad was a highly prized individual. A very special man. Only he's blind. Son of highly prized. Do you remember what they thought of blind people? John 9, kind of a great description of it. When they come to Jesus and say, who sinned, this man or, the, the, or, or his parents? If somebody's blind, if the, somebody has an illness or something like that, they've obviously sinned. That was simply the belief of the day. Here's blind Bartimaeus, son of highly prized, but not feeling very prized, is he? He's sitting out there on the street. He's it, it, got a really, really bad life. People throw stones at him. They tease him. They try to rip him off. He has to beg for everything that he's going to get. Maybe he gets fed today. Maybe he doesn't. Life is difficult and challenging and it's a pain. And on top of that, nobody wants him around because he's a bad person. He's a sinner. That's obviously why he's blind. Dad, highly prized. Bartimaeus, 
worthless. And the people add to it, don't they? Man, just be quiet. It's Jesus of Nazareth and we don't want you bothering him. And he hollers all the more. And the amazing thing is, is that as he's crying out, I love it. So, uh, do, you, do you ever notice the short phrases, how powerful they are? Mark says, Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. Remember the dream I had. I was riding my bike. The son was riding with me, riding down the road. And all of a sudden, oh no, Tim, we're in the way of the fire engine. Oh no, we're making it stop. And then I came to and the ambulance driver said, we're taking you to the hospital, Bill. That was one of my other bike accidents in the alley before I came here. <laughs> you know, you really don't want the siren to stop right in front of where you're at unless you really need it. And Jesus stopped. And he said, get him. Bring him to me. Call him. Jesus, stop. This is what a precious moment. Here's this blind man who feels worthless and dirty and, and, and is unable to do anything for himself. This man who's just in all kinds of agony. And Jesus stops and says, come. The crowd gets the idea. They recognize. You see their response? Hey, cheer up, man. You've got something to be happy about. He wants to see you. This is one of those incredible moments where Jesus is on the way. Did I say already? He was on the way for a battle with hell. Nothing is going to get between him and that cross and that battle with hell. But he stops to speak to a man and to set him free. He stops to take away the blindness of a man and to give him salvation. He stops for that one. Mark will tell us that as, as the man hears this and the, hear, the crowd saying, Hey, he wants you! that the man jumps up, throws off his cloak, and starts heading for Jesus. Now, I don't know how he was doing it. Maybe helped, guided by the other people that were there. But, but that coat's in his way. That coat could make him trip. That coat is a reminder of all the things that he's been through in the past. And he says, I'm going to get rid of everything right now that's in my way. Everything that's holding me back. Anything that's hindering me, I'm taking it off. And I'm heading for Jesus. Yeah, there's an application there, isn't there? Some of us need to get rid of anything that's hindering us to go to Jesus. He gets in front of Jesus and what does Jesus say? What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? You know, you could have asked anything, right? <laughs> he says, I want to see. King James Version of Mark's Gospel says that, that Bartimaeus says, I want to see again. That mean that he had seen in the past? <coughs> Is that why he's blind? Because of something that he had done? People got sick easily and blindness was very common in Jesus' day because of all the dirt and the illness and everything. And so many people went blind. Cataracts would cause... I mean, there's all kinds of things that cause... You get attached retina. All kinds of things that cause a blindness in Jesus' day. It was a very common thing. So many people ended out on the streets begging. And he says, you know what? But, the, but it's interesting. The word that's used there is anablepo. Blepo means to see. Ana means up. It's the same word that's used when Jesus is praying for the five loaves and the two fish. And what does it say he does? He looks up to heaven. He anablepoed. And he blesses the bread and the fish. And he breaks it and divides it among the people. And many a time where it says that Jesus looked up to heaven, the word that is used is anablepo. 
What is it that this man is asking? He's not just asking, I want to see. He says, I want to look up and see. I want to look up and see you, Jesus. I don't know. I want to look up and see God. He says, I want to honor Blepo. And Jesus says, okay, great. Here you go. And he, said, he sets his eyes free and he says he can go and live. Now the, the man responds incidentally with a very unique word. He says, Rabboni. Many of you heard that before? Let me refresh your memory. We'll hear it again when we get to the rest of the setting and the experience that will happen after the cross. Mary goes to the well, to, excuse me, to the, to the um, graveside. <laughs> Gets to the graveside. Jesus' body is missing. She leaves the grave, comes back out, and a gardener approaches her from behind. And she starts to ask him, where, where have you taken, where have you taken Jesus? And she, the gardener speaks again, only it's not the gardener. Well, not the gardener she expects. It's the gardener of earth. It's Jesus. And when she looks him in the eye and realizes it's him, she says, Rabboni, my teacher, my rabbi, my master, my Lord. Bartimaeus is using that same term of endearment, that term of worship. Rabboni, Rabboni, I want to see up. I want to look up and see. I want to have the ability to recognize heaven. You know, <clears throat> There are a lot of blind people in Jesus' day. Did they all get healed? You should all be saying no. No, they didn't. There are a lot of people today that believe in Jesus and pray for miracles. Do they all get healed? No, they don't. In Jesus' idea, what do you think is the most important miracle? Rise from the dead. Shh, don't tell the secret, Anna. Rise from the dead, being able to see, getting rid of cancer, leukemia, um, no longer be a diabetic. What's the most important? Front row's got it. Salvation. 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 Take note of what Jesus says to blind Bartimaeus when he gives him his sight. He says, salvation, so so, has come to you. Go, said Jesus. Verse 52. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Go, Bartimaeus. Your faith has healed you. The word that's used there is not the word we would expect. It's not the one that says, you've been healed. Instead, it's you've been saved. Your faith has has saved you, Bartimaeus. Your faith has given you life, Bartimaeus. Because Bartimaeus, the most important healing of all is for you to be able to see Jesus and believe. Folks, what about you? There's a couple of thoughts I have for this morning. What do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? Bartimaeus was pretty clear. I want to see. I want to see. 